Welcome, everyone. My name is Keisha Carter, and I am a part of the Learning and Development Department with Hanger, and I have the honor of producing today's call for Phil Stevens and our panelists. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Phil Stevens. He's the Director of Clinical and Scientific Affairs for Hanger Clinic. Phil is a 2015 recipient of the J.E. Hanger Clinical Excellence Award, former president of the American Academy of Orthotists and Prophetists, and co-editor of the Atlas of Amputations and Limb Deficiencies, Surgical, Prosthetic, and Rehabilitation Principles. With that, Phil, I'll pass things over to you. Very good. Thank you, Keisha. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the many attendees that we have from across the profession who have carved a little bit of time out of their day today uh, to join us in this webinar. And I'm confident that we've uh, chosen a topic that will justify that time. The topic that we've chosen today is clinical outcomes. Now, this is something that as a profession, we've given due lip service to uh, over the years. You, you may have seen a, a, a presentation here or there. Occasionally, we see an article in one of our publications. But in recent years, clinical outcomes has really started to catch on. I dare say it's even begun to turn the corner a little bit. So our goal today is to talk about clinical outcomes, to talk about ways that we can create a culture of outcomes in our individual clinical settings. Uh, to talk about ways we can ensure that the outcomes we collect ultimately benefit the individuals we're working with, uh, both at the individual level, but also at the level of the population, making sure the population benefits from, from the, the outcomes exercise. Um, I'm joined today by really a first-class panel of experts, familiar uh, experts within this area in the field. Uh, first, we have Brittany Fossett, a certified prosthetist and head of research at Barber Prosthetic Clinic in Vancouver, Canada. Uh, we're also joined by Dr. Brian Hafner, who is a professor at the, uh, within the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine at the University of Washington. And we're joined by Dr. Shane Werdeman, who is a, a director of clinical research at Hanger Clinic. The first question that we want to tackle as a panel today is this idea of how we can create a culture of outcomes collect, uh, collection within our individual clinic settings. And Brittany, we're going to start with you. We've, we've spoken before. You work in a smaller clinic where you have the benefit of a face time with a small group of clinicians. Um, how have you gone about establishing this, this culture of outcomes collection within your individual clinic? Mm -hmm. Thanks. So the first thing that we did was actually buy everybody on our staff a Fitbit. And we found that this quickly normalized discussions about data and showed our entire staff team the power that data can have in a very short amount of time. So within a couple of days, our lunch hour conversations were completely transformed. Now as we sat around eating our lunch, we found ourselves talking about who was winning the leaderboard, who had taken the most steps that week. We also found that as we checked our phones and looked at the data, if we saw someone had jumped 30,000 steps that day, we asked them, what had they done that weekend that gave them such a huge jump? Had they gone hiking? Had they gone for a run? We started to link activities and things that they have done in their home time with the scores that we are seeing. We also found that most of us were guilty of altering our behavior based on this data. So if our goal was 10,000 steps a day and it was getting quite late and we checked our phone and realized that we were at 8,500 or 9,000 steps, most of us went for an extra walk. We walked the halls of our apartment or walked around the block to get that extra thousand steps to push us over, over our goal. And so buying the Fitbits really created a lot of buy-in from our team that data can be quite powerful, that it can be very motivating for the individual and it can also facilitate conversation quite easily. So once we had this as our groundwork, we then chose a small set of outcome measures to implement in our practice. First, I modeled that it was possible to be done by a clinician in clinical appointments, and then we encouraged everyone to adopt this set. But we are a very small clinic in one location. We often see each other doing the outcome measures. And so this serves uh, two things. First, it, it reminds us that we're doing this as a team, that we're all in it together. And the second thing is it triggers us to remember to do outcome measures when we have a patient that needs them as well. So once we started using outcome measures, we then set up regular follow-ups. And this also did two things. First, it served as an, an accountability, a place where we could ask each other how it was going. How were we getting our patients to do them? Are there patients that we were missing? 
And the next thing it did is allowed us to share stories of how the outcome measures were influencing our patients and impacting our care that we were providing them. Our clinicians tell us that when they understand the why of outcome measures, of how it impacts other clinicians' care and really how it impacts the patient, that is one of the key motivators to getting them to use outcome measures in their practice. And so at these meetings, we focused on sharing stories of how it was affecting us and our patients. And then the last thing that we did was we continuously refine our outcome measure process. We want everyone on our staff team and our patients to feel like they own it, that part of it is theirs too. So we ask our clinicians, what is working for you? What is not working for you? And what helps you do outcome measures better or more regularly? And once we know this, we then tweak our protocol to try and address some of the challenges and highlight some of the benefits. We also ask our patients how they feel about this process. The feedback from them helps us to refine this as well, and it really helps to motivate our staff team to show them the value of the outcome measures to our patients and to encourage them to keep going. And finally, in our current space, we do a lot of our outcome measures in the middle of our lab. And so we actually asked our technicians how they found outcome measures helpful and how outcome measures could actually inform how they do their work. Um, and by doing this, we got them to understand a little bit more about how important outcome measures are and see the value for themselves and for us so that when we're getting in their way on a daily basis, there's a little bit more grace and a little bit more understanding for why we're doing this and why it's so important for our clinic. Thank you for that, Brittany. Uh, now, Shane, you, you're dealing with a very different set of challenges, right? You've got uh, a number of clinics spread out across the country where you don't have the benefit of face-to-face uh, -face interactions on a regular basis, uh, but you're still trying to create that same culture of outcomes collection uh, within your clinical setting. So can you speak to some of the challenges that, uh, that, you, that you've uh, encountered as you tried to create that culture across a very broad set of clinics uh, really spread across the country? Yeah, I, I mean, you're absolutely right, Phil. It, it really is a different challenge uh, when, when we have, you know, a larger organization mm -hmm. where I, I can't get in front of my fellow clinicians and the other clinic staff to really continue to reinforce the value of outcomes. Um, we, you know, instead, we do have to lean heavily on our regional leadership to continue to reinforce that, that culture of outcomes. Um, if, if we go back to when we first started this, I would say one of the things that we kind of did was we embraced the innovation adoption curve, per se. Um, I've recreated that for the slide that you see there. And what that is, is, you know, that really speaks to how quickly individuals adopt new, most commonly it's used in the context of technology. But it talks to, you know, how quickly someone is, is willing to bring in this new technology or, or it may be a new process. Um, and you really have, you know, the innovators that are very quick to adopt and onboard. Um, and then you have going back to early adopters, early majority. And what we did was we said, okay, we need to start with finding our innovators, the individuals that are going to quickly adopt and bring on outcomes as part of their, their routine, their regular practice. Um, we also, truthfully, were looking for individuals that we felt had a strong reputation of excellence. Um, and that was because what we, what we would hope is that once those individuals were onboarded, we could then use them as a catalyst to influence and, and bring on other individuals, you know, the early adopters, the early majority, and so on. Um, so, so we did, actually. After we had those individuals on board, we, you know, we went out of our way to highlight their activity. Um, we've featured them in various newsletters. Uh, at our national meeting, we had multiple clinicians up on stage to you know, present what, what they find to be beneficial, as well as some of their pitfalls. Um, you know, all of this was, was really uh, to help with, with creating that culture, but also to just emphasize that it wasn't, you know, this was really a, a true company change, not a you know, a department initiative. Um, now that said, uh, you know, to be honest, we did have some missteps. Um, you know, I think early on we wrongly thought this was a clinician responsibility and we, and we put it, you know, really in the hands of the clinicians. And what we've come to find in hindsight, it's one of those things you look back and say, how did we make that 
mistake is that this is you know if you're going to create a culture then everyone that's part of that needs to be involved so that includes you know as Brittany mentioned you know all of a sudden we recognize we need to have our admin more aware you know whether they're putting together a claim to help be able to recognize the outcomes are there as another instrument to show what's happening with the patient uh, you're talking at the front desk we started to realize that as soon as the patient gets there that's a quick opportunity to capture the outcomes um, so that that was our first misstep and, and luckily it didn't take us too long to realize that and so we corrected that I think you know the last point just looking at the innovation adoption curve you know when we talk about some of our slow adopters the other thing we've done is is recognize that people are motivated differently uh, and so for example with some individuals we've had to take more time to really walk them through just really the changing landscape of healthcare um, just in terms of you know a shift from fee for service to more of a fee for value and understanding that outcomes is really a way to to show the value of, of the service we provide to our patients um, for others it was talking about you know using this you can actually help with with getting better access uh, to the devices that your patients need um, and then actually one of the real interesting things is you know I'm sure throughout this webinar at some point we'll, we'll discuss some of the manuscripts we've published but we also found that when the manuscripts were published there was this large uptick in outcomes mm -hmm. efforts and it was almost um, I think there's a large number of individuals that take pride in being part of something that they know is a bigger bigger effort um, so yeah I think that would probably be how I would frame that for you Phil yeah thank you Shane uh, now Brian uh, clinical outcomes right this is something you and I have pushed in the field for a little over a decade now um, and, and we're starting to see that that culture of outcomes permeate throughout the field. I wanted to give you a few minutes to kind of speak to that transition that we've seen here in recent years as clinical outcomes are beginning to uh, take hold within the profession. Great. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Um, I think my first comment here would be to really to uh, applaud both Brittany and Shane for their efforts. It's To me, it's really incredible to see organizations like Hanger and Barber take on these efforts with really such commitment. Um, as somebody that's been in a field in the field for a while, it's been really exciting for me to to see how outcome measurement has just really taken on this kind of increasingly greater level of importance, as you mentioned over time. You know, when I first entered the profession uh, more than 20 years ago now, you might occasionally hear somebody at a conference mention this idea of outcome measures, right? But they were largely directed, you know, at use in you know by researchers and research studies. And I think it wasn't until the last decade, as you alluded to, Phil, that really we've begun to see them become far more common in, in clinical practice. And, and now when you go to a conference, you see example after example of people like Shane and Brittany, you know, sharing results from some of these outcomes that they've collected in clinical practice. And it's just been, um, it's been really inspiring for me to, to see that. So uh, kudos really, guys, it's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the big reasons for this change, I think, is, is kind of that outcomes, for, uh, outcomes measurement has really become more integral into our clinical education. I think prosthetic and orthotic students, uh, really from the beginning of their training, are learning how to select, administer, and apply these outcome measures in routine clinical practice. Uh, you know, I still recognize that as a field, we, we still have a, a long way to go. And uh, I think organizations like Hanger, like Barber, are still trying to find ways to adopt this, this culture into their practices. And I suspect that there's, there's many on the, the lower end of that curve that Shay mentioned. You know, but I think examples like this really are inspiring and illustrate to me really just how far we've come towards this as a, as a goal for our profession. And, you know, I, I think as I, I reflect on some of their comments that they made earlier, I'd like to, you know, kind of echo a few of those that, um, you know, first of all, whether the organization is a, a larger one like Hanger or maybe a smaller one like Barber, it's really about this process of establishing this culture of measurement. You know, how do you get buy-in from everybody that all you know everyone that's involved in the process and this is as was alluded to includes things like the management administrative staff the clinicians and really the patient too and and i think everyone in this process should sort of find ways to perceive value in it and in the data that comes out of it so and i think um you know one way that i i believe uh, this comes about is to 
uh, really find that person that's the champion, somebody like Brittany, like Shane, uh, who can really lead and inspire others in your organization. I think it's important that that the uh, management uh, identify and support those early adopters that Shane alluded to, and find those people that are willing re- uh, willing to put in that extra effort to take on this challenge. Because I think it's those are the people that that really set the standard and kind of begin to establish and uh, formulate this culture within the organization. I think uh, perhaps most importantly, I think you really need to find ways to engage the patient in this process, as Brittany mentioned. Um, I truly believe that outcome measures should not be passive. You know, they, it's, I think too many of us have been in that situation where you go into a doctor's office and you go up to the front office staff and you get that little survey, right? And you sit down and you, you fill it all out, you give it back, and then that disappears into some sort of a black hole, never seen, to be seen from again. Um, and I, as a patient, I never liked that process. You know, I wanted to say, well, I took the time to fill this out. I gave you this information. How come you never used it? So I think it's critically important that we collect and use that information, that we share it with the patient and allow them to become part of the process of care. Uh, as we heard from, from Brittany, you know, that, that's just critical to really not only getting their buy-in, but also the other stakeholders as well. So I think the more that we can involve the patients in the process of the care, the more likely we are going to be to engage everyone else in the process as well. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, you, you, you brought up a great point, this idea of engaging the patient, and it really leads naturally into our next question. Um, how can we ensure that outcomes benefit individuals? I mean, Brian set it up quite nicely there, Brittany, but we'll start with you again uh, in a smaller setting there in Barbara Clinic. Um, what, 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 what did you find helpful? What resources were facilitated that transition to making these outcomes more beneficial to the individual who, after all, is, is sharing their, their uh, clinical experience? Mm-hmm. So outcome measures can have many benefits. They can serve to motivate our patients, to facilitate communication, help with evaluating treatment, uh, clinical decisions, or even setting goals. But in order to do any of those things, there's two things that are very important. So the first of these, we need to make sure that our clinicians understand how to interpret outcome measures. They need to know what the results actually mean. We need to make sure that everybody on staff is trained to interpret these on the fly. So when a clinician administers an outcome measure to a patient, as soon as they see the score, they know what it means. And if there's been a change in the score, they know what that change means. And unless they know this, they won't see the value in doing outcome measures or have the information to be able to have meaningful conversations with our patients. So I saw this firsthand in the very, very early days of outcome measure use. One of our clinicians took it upon themselves to memorize the normative values for some of the outcome measures we were using. And I was just standing in the back of our clinic overhearing him administer this outcome measure. And as soon as the patient was done, he said, this is your score and this is how it compares to the norms of people with your level of amputation and your age. And I saw the patient's response to that, how encouraged he was and how excited he was about his progress so early on in his rehab. And that really solidified for myself and for the team how we need to be able to interpret those scores right on the fly as soon as those tests are done. And this leads to the second point. We really need to get the results in the hands of the patients, as Brian had said. We can't just stick them in a computer. We need to be sharing these. And I will admit, this has been a very huge struggle for us. This is something that we've wrestled through, but it's so important. When we share the results with our patients, they can feel involved. They feel like the time that they've put into this measure is worth it, and they can celebrate their successes, and we can have conversations when there's been a downfall or a fallback. So right, what you see here is an example of a patient going through rehab. So you see some of their outcome measure scores two weeks into rehab, six weeks into rehab, and at discharge. And from here, it's quite obvious that this patient has had a huge increase in their scores over the time of their rehab. And so for this particular patient, this is hugely encouraging and hugely motivating to see that all this hard work that I've put in has paid off. My numbers have gone up and here's proof of this. They also, patients love to be able to share this with their family or their friends, to take it and show people, say, I've been working so hard and here's something that shows that. It also lets us communicate with the other members of the rehab team very easily. So it's quite an obvious change in this case. For another example, let's look at the two-minute walk test. So some patients are very competitive. 
And this test is very easy to get them to do because they want to outperform their prior score. They'll come in asking to do the test again because they've been working hard and they think they can beat it. But other patients are more hesitant and uncertain about if they can do it. For these individuals, we sometimes see it having an, a positive impact on their emotional well-being. Once they complete the test, we see them encouraged by how far they were able to go in two minutes. And sometimes we even see it motivate lifestyle changes when they understand and they realize that they can walk farther than they thought they could. So for some patients, this leads to them participating in different events that may require a little bit more walking than they thought they could do. For some patients, this changes their vacation plans. They go on vacations with a little bit more walking involved. And we've actually had some patients buy a dog because now they felt like they could actually take their dog for a walk. And so we see outcome measures having benefits on the patient's daily lives. But in order to do this, we need to know what the results mean and we need to get those results into the hands of the patient. Thank you, Brittany. Uh, now, Shane, uh, we've alluded to it earlier, you're in a very different setting uh, with, with a larger setting with more clinics that you're trying to, to impact and influence. But I'm sure you've given a great deal of thought to some of the challenges that Brittany just articulated. Uh, can you react a little bit and how, uh, how your experience may have uh, differed or been the same as what she's articulated? Yeah, I mean, I, I think my initial reaction would be to probably echo a lot of the comments from Brittany, a lot of the sentiment there. You know, it, especially when you talk about getting the scores to the patient, you know, that can definitely be a challenge. You know, it's another workflow, uh, work process change. <clears throat> One of the things that we did when we started this was, you know, we made it a priority to select an instrument that was easily translatable to our patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so we did, we chose the plus M, um, which, you know, Thank you to a uh, fellow presenter, Dr. Hafner, behind his, his work with uh, developing the instrument. And, you know, that is a, a measure of mobility, but the real value was, you know, and as Brittany had alluded to, was that immediately when, when giving the outcome to the patient, they could get their score and then quickly be able to put it in the context of everyone else out there that uses a prosthesis. Um, and if we wanted to, we could drill down further and say, okay, not just everyone that uses a prosthesis, but these are individuals that are similar to you. Um, I think you know, when, whenever anyone's going through any kind of rehab or, or injury, you know, they, they're asking themselves, you know, how impacted am I really from this? And, you know, and, and, and in the road to recovery, am I progressing, you know, as typical? Is, am I accelerated, delayed? And Previously, they really had to rely on their clinician and the anecdotal experience of their clinician to help that, that uh, answer that question. Now they can quickly look and see, okay, this is how I compare to, you know, everyone else out there that's using a prosthesis. Um, and, that, and that provided, uh, I think, a lot of benefit in helping the, the patient benefit. Um, I think the next challenge that we quickly encountered was, you know, as Brittany alluded to, was getting that score to the patient, which one of the things we, we did was you know, we sat down and said, okay, we need to come up with a better vehicle for getting that, that score to the patient. And what you see on the screen here is actually the scorecard that kind of came from that, those conversations and, and deliberations and, and ultimately the, the napkin, you know, was, is where that was formulated on. Um, and what you're looking at is really a graphical presentation of the results. So we can now hand the patient their scorecard and they can see how they're doing now. If they've got previous scores, they can see how they've done in the past. Um, they can quickly understand how they're doing compared to similar prosthesis users. Um, so all that, again, in a very quick and easy to digest format. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so for my myself, actually, I, I have one case where I actually walked into the room with one of my patients and I, I gave her her scorecard and you know it had two data points on it and one was from a previous year and one was current and you know to the unknowing person they would just see it as two data points but for her and I as we sat there and reflected on that you know we were thinking of all the times that she had come into the office and, and all the adjustments and, and changes 
to really continue to refine and optimize as she progressed through her rehab. You know, I'm sure she was thinking about all the physical therapy appointments that she went through, her, her PM&R mm -hmm. appointments. And, you know, all of this was, was just displayed in these two simple data points. And, you know, that's what we, that's what hopefully outcomes will, will become is it's not, it's not a data exercise. It's really a, a capture of the patient's journey. Um, and that's, you know, hopefully mm -hmm. our scorecard will help to facilitate that uh, conversation between the clinician and the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shane, as I listen to you, I think this just highlights that we all come across different challenges when we're implementing outcome measures. Personally, our clinicians have understand the value, but we've been challenged by how to get that, that scorecard, how to get the number from the computer to the patient. And just for everyone in the audience, I think if you, or while you're going through this process of bringing outcome measures into your clinic, you're gonna face challenges and it's gonna look different for everyone based on the clinic you work with and the makeup of your staff team. And so we just encourage you to work through those challenges and to seek out others in the field perhaps that have gone across similar challenges and have found a way around them. Cause we've all done that. And we're all just continually trying to get over the next hump and learn more about how to do this better in our individual settings. Well, thank you both for the thoughts there on, on how we can make these outcomes more relevant to the individuals. I mean, it sounds to me like it's really just another facet of patient-focused care that we've been trying to practice for, for years, as it were. Um, but as we start to collect these outcomes from individual patients, before long, we begin to have several data points that we can begin to aggregate. And as that data set grows, we begin to have an, an opportunity and really maybe a, a responsibility to aggregate that data and use that data to benefit not only the individual patients we're working with, uh, but also the patient populations, the patient communities that we get to work with. So um, Shane, you've really been a leader in this space for the last few years. Uh, I'd like to start the conversation with you. Uh, how can we ensure that our measured outcomes ultimately benefit these broader patient communities? So, you know, in terms of a just a broad response, I'm going to just initially just say that the first thing we can do is all uh, as a profession own our responsibility as part of the profession to to incorporate outcomes into our routine practice. Um, now, moving into kind of more specifically, you know, what we've done with with Hanger is, um, you know, when we started this, we did immediately recognize that we would have the ability to quickly capture a lot of outcomes on, on the, our patients. And by having that, you know, when you talk about this buzzword population health, right? Well, a critical component to population health is being able to measure the population. And, you know, the, while there's a lot of value in, in many of the research studies that have been in our field, you know, 10 to 20, 30 patients doesn't really tell us about the population. Um, so we immediately said, okay, if we're going to do this, let's do it in a way that we can really on the back end be able to understand the population we serve. Um, to do that, there's really two things that, that we had to put into place. Um, and so that was, you know, first was making sure that we're having common collection practices. So everyone had to collect it similar time frames um, we can just at any point so we did put out minimum time points for collection uh, and then we had to have a common um, measurement or a core outcome measure that we would ask our clinicians to collect now a pitfall of a core outcome measure is that you're you're going to be measuring that regardless of whether that's the goal of care so you know in our case mobility was the primary construct and there might be cases where that's not at all what the patient is being seen for. You know, it might be a socket discomfort issue. Um, but, you know, the advantage of it was it would allow us to ultimately aggregate it. And, and our clinicians are always still monitoring that. One of the things that's been kind of a sidebar is that we've actually now starting to see that even some of these issues that maybe aren't straightforward addressing mobility uh, actually do have an impact on the patient's mobility. Um, and then, you know, the other, I would say the other benefit, too, of taking the approach of a core outcome measure is that it can alleviate the stress uh, or anxiety that some clinicians may have when starting with outcomes. You have 
you know, some clinicians are very anxious about just picking the quote unquote right outcome instrument mm -hmm. that they have one that they know they're going to collect then then that really I think you know overcome that so by putting into place a common measure common time points then that positioned us to where once we started to have a certain number of outcome measures yes we uh, our our smaller team then aggregated this data and you know you see on the screen here, this is the first five publications. Um, it's actually now six publications. Um, and we have a few more that are actually in review. But I th I think the you know one of the biggest values of this is that you know, if for example you look at MAT1 in the top left corner there, that was our first publication, and we found that there's this strong uh, relationship between in, uh, improved mobility and, and increased or improved quality of life. Now, you know what that means is that it's no longer me as a as a prosthetist sitting there saying, "Look, if I can get this patient more mobile, you know they're going to enjoy a higher quality of life, a better quality of life." Uh, instead, it's really several hundred patients that together have have voiced, you know, what's important to them. Um, so, by doing by doing this aggregation and and in this manner that we're doing it, it really allows us to amplify the patient's voices. Um, thank you, Phil, for the chance to respond to that. Yeah, very good. Now, uh, Dr. Hafner, as, as the, one of the developers of the Plus M uh, that was designed with, with this kind of purpose in mind of being able to aggravate or aggregate that, that common experience into a, into a single patient voice, uh, can, can you share your thoughts on this question of how we ensure that uh, collected outcomes benefit patient populations as well? Sure. Thanks, Phil. And, uh, you know, like Shane, I, I really believe that there is just enormous potential for us as a field to use the data that can be captured in routine clinical practice to, I think, advance our understanding of whether it be the, the patients we treat, the interventions that are used in practice, or really the, the outcomes that we can expect for our patients. I think, you know, historically, this type of information was gathered through scientific research studies that Shane alluded to. And, and while the, the data that we collect, you know, through research studies and publishing research studies and all that is really critical import, critically important to advancing our, our knowledge and understanding of, of prosthetic and orthotic outcomes, uh, they are really often limited by kind of small sample sizes and the relatively short periods of time that we have to collect data. Um, so I think data gathered from outcome measures that are applied in, in routine practice can maybe overcome some of these limitations and allow us to ask and, and hopefully answer some really important questions that really can't be uh, answered under uh, other ways or using traditional research methods. You know, so for example, one area that comes to mind is, you know, that outcomes from uh, outcomes that are collected in clinical practice could be used to study the long-term effectiveness of different types of uh, orthotic and prosthetic interventions. You know, typically in, in intervention-based intervention research studies that we do, um, that I do in my research, you know, we often focus on measuring the eff efficacy of a device or really how a device works under idealized conditions. Um, I think it's, it's uh, less common that we really study the effectiveness or the performance of devices under real-world conditions that, that you often see in clinical practice. Um, so I think gathering this type of information uh, through outcomes measurement that's done in, in routine clinical practice could really help us to get a, a better understanding about which technologies we have that work best and really for which patients they work best. And I think having this information would allow us to potentially work more closely with payers and providers uh, and help us kind of collectively as a field really advocate for new technologies and treatments by really demonstrating that these things work as we expect that they do or maybe not. Um, so I think that's that's really important, and we have a lot of potential there that is, uh, I think, yet untapped. Um, of course, a challenge, is, as Shane alluded to, is that uh, we need to be using kind of a common set of outcome measures so that we can aggregate and, and compare these data across different patients, across different practices and practitioners, and ultimately across our entire profession. But I think if, if we as a clinical community are able to find a way to come to consensus on the outcome measures that we should use, or at least, you know, a subset of them, um, and try to find ways to consistently administer those outcome measures in clinical practice, use them to monitor our patients over time, and then find a ways to combine and aggregate these data, I think that we could really significantly advance the quality 
uh, safety and, and ultimately the effectiveness of the care that we provide. Great. No, thank you for that, Brian. Uh, at this point, we'd like to spend uh, some time addressing a few questions. Uh, we've been monitoring questions as, as they've been coming in. There's one question that we sort of anticipated that we'd like to start with. Um, and it's kind of a natural follow-up to some of the content that we've heard this far. You know, we have folks on the on the call that uh, they've heard what we talked about. They realize that outcomes are becoming increasingly popular. They're ready to get started. Now, how do I start? You know, the question is, um, what outcome measure should I should I use? Uh, how do I select the most appropriate outcome measure for my clinical setting? Um, so, Brian, you've worked in this space for a long time in, in the development of outcomes. How would you answer that question? What outcome measure should I be using in my clinical setting? I think this is uh, probably one of the questions I get asked most often by the clinicians I meet, and it's uh, it, it, it is a challenging question to answer. I think there's a lot of factors that go into selecting uh, an outcome measure, whether it's the right one or any outcome measure. It's you know questions like what kind of patients are you trying to measure, what uh, constructs or outcomes are you trying to assess, what is the purpose of that assessment? Are you trying to evaluate somebody over time, discriminate between groups, things like that? How much uh, time, space, or, and resources, equipment do you have to, you know, perform these tests? All these things can can work together and, and factor into your decision and, um, you know, determine the kinds of outcome measures that you should consider. I think mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the most important things that I would recommend is trying to decide between whether uh, what's called a standardized or an ad hoc outcome measure. So ad hoc outcome measures are, are typically custom surveys that might be developed by a researcher or a clinic for a very specific purpose, but they often don't have a lot of uh, testing done on them. Um, and so they, because they maybe haven't been well tested, they maybe haven't been well vetted, and, and so we probably don't know a whole lot about how they, uh, whether or actually, or how they work. Um, alternatively, standardized outcome measures, like the plus M that was alluded to earlier, are instruments that often undergo uh, a structured process of development and testing and development and testing. <laughs> um, and this process can really be pretty extensive. Uh, it could, it's also time consuming and, it, and it's uh, often expensive too. Um, as an example, this slide that you put up, there was really an overview of the development process for the plus M that we talked about earlier. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of different steps involved in, in creating a good outcome measure and, uh, you know, a number of separate sub-studies that occur uh, within that framework. So really, you know, in total, we've spent more than, I would say, six or seven years already uh, putting effort into developing and testing Plus M to really make sure that it works the way that we think it does and, and give the users, you know, clinicians and researchers that kind of valuable information that they need to use it appropriately uh, in their practices. Um, but because you know standardized measures go through this process, um, they really tend to have what uh, superior, what we call psychometric properties, or really the evidence that they work as they're intended to. Um, and, and one attribute that uh, Brittany actually alluded to a little bit earlier that's important, I think anyway, is the uh, availability or, or presence of normative scores or norms. Uh, and norms are really those kind of typical uh, or uh, traditional values that come from different types of people that can help um, set the, the stage for what that score means. So, and if you choose an outcome measure with a norm, you're really able to compare results from a given individual to similar types of patients. And this provides that context, like Shane talked about, that really allows you to interpret what that score means. So therefore, like, uh, when I am asked that question, which outcome measure should I use, I often uh, recommend A, that they choose a standardized measure and one that's got some norms so that they can use that information to convey the uh, interpretation of the score to the patient, to others, uh, to physicians and therapists. Um, and I really only recommend that you use ad hoc measures as kind of um, uh, purposeful uh, so kind of less developed outcome measures uh, in cases when standardized measures don't exist, or maybe when you're trying to complement something and you know that there's just not something that exists. So that's probably the, the kind of the top level recommendation that I would provide. No, thank you for that, Brian. And now, Brittany, Shane kind of mentioned his, his rationale behind selecting the plus M for his clinic in his setting. You also mentioned that you have a core set of outcomes that you use at Barber Prosthetics. Can you speak a little bit to how you develop that core set of outcomes? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that we did is we sat down and decided what construct are we interested in measuring. So talking with the rest, our entire staff team, 
what do we care about? What do we want to know? Is it comfort? Is it mobility? Is it the activity level of the patient outside of the clinic? Is it pain, uh, socket comfort, quality of life? There's so many different things that an outcome measure can measure. So the first thing you have to do is choose what do you want to measure? And we decided to measure something across all of our patients with lower extremity amputations. So instead of tailoring it to the individual needs, our core set is for everybody. And then if there are specific things you want to measure for a patient, you can use an additional measure to capture that. So once we had our construct, then we looked at the literature about reliability and validity and interpretability. Is it a, is it a valid measure? Is it a reliable measure? Is it suitable for use in clinic? And once we had this, we looked at how does it fit into our clinic? How does it fit into our space? What is the time requirement? What is the cost requirement? Is there any special equipment that we have to purchase to use this outcome measure? And once we looked at all those things, we gave preference to those measures with interpretability, as we've talked about before, those that we could show our patients very easily the meaning behind their score and the change to their score. So taking all of this into consideration and really a lot of what Brian mentioned above, this led us to select our core set which has been the socket comfort score, the plus M, and the two-minute walk test. Great. Thank you for that. Um, in, in scrolling through uh, some of the questions that have come in during the course of the, uh, of the webinar, th there's one theme that has kind of cropped up over and over again, and it's this idea of uh, how do you find the time? You know, we have folks mm -hmm. that are willing to do this, they're interested in doing this, but, but how do you find the time? And that's a pretty legitimate concern. Now, as a panel, we kind of discussed this uh, in, in preparation for the webinar. And, and Brittany, you mentioned that as you were selecting your outcome measures for, for that core set you just described, you gave some considerable attention to this thought of, of, of time and, and where they'd find that time and, and how to reduce that time for a clinician that's willing to give this a shot. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that? Yeah, so when we decided to implement outcome measures, we decided as a clinic that 10 minutes in the entire course of someone's care would be an acceptable time commitment. And so we, for us, we set, uh, set time intervals and when we use outcome measures. And so for us, we decided that five minutes at initial eval and five minutes on a definitive device uh, was what we were going to do. And so using our core set and some other measures, I'll admit it took us a little bit of time to get to that five minutes. So the first time that you administer these measures, you're trying to find the measures, you're trying to find your equipment, you're trying to remember all the different things. It was a lot more than five minutes, but after doing it continuously and regularly with our patients within a couple of weeks and or months, it was below five minutes um, pretty, pretty regularly. And so given the benefit of it, is very worth the time commitment to put in. And I'd say most of the time commitment is just in learning how to do those measures and getting a system that works for you. And once you have that system and that habit established, it's quite easy to get that, uh, that time down to five minutes. Great, now I appreciate that perspective. Uh, Shane, I'm, I'm sure you've encountered this question in, in your role as well within your organization. Uh, how would you react to that, that, that question of, of how do I find the time? You know, I think Brittany's comments are very uh, well articulated, and I I actually think what she said is applicable regardless of the organization you're in. Um, what what they've done there is absolutely across all organizations applicable. Um, you know, and I think one of the things that I've responded to with this is that you know if if you can change your workflow, you'll actually find that this will start to bring more time back you'll you'll actually have time and what i mean by that for example is you know if you're a clinician right now on this webinar i guarantee you've had a, the time where you've been in a room with a patient that maybe showed up late meanwhile the next patient showed up early and so now you're in room one next patient's in room two waiting and you can actually if you change your workflow and encompass uh, incorporate outcomes as part of it, you know, you can actually buy that time with that patient because the patient can actually be doing some of these outcomes that don't require uh, and actually are uh, um, potentially even better that the clinician's not right there. Uh, 
the patient can be doing that while they're waiting and now they know that that they are engaged in in care they're not just quote unquote waiting but they're they're busy they're doing something that helps advance um their their ultimate rehab so i think that's what i would add to that phil thank you great thank you Bill. well i want to leave a little bit of time here at the end uh, to, to wrap up the webinar uh, i want to take a minute to thank our panelists um who have uh, certainly given up a lot of their time in, in preparation for this webinar event I also want to thank all of those individuals throughout the profession, throughout the field, who have carved out some time to join us for this conversation today. Uh, it's clear to me uh, that we have kind of turned that corner in our field. Uh, the clinical outcomes are, are here to stay. Um, and that, uh, you know, considering this transition, we as a field need to continue to work together uh, to find ways that we can refine and strengthen this culture of outcomes collection across the field. Uh, you know, staying true to some of the principles that we talked about on today's webinar, making sure that the outcomes that we collect ultimately benefit the individual patients that we're working with, and making sure that we use those outcomes uh, to benefit those broader patient populations as well. And with that, I'll turn it over to Keisha to uh, conclude the webinar. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bill, and our panelists. I would like to take this time to thank everyone for joining us on this call today, and we definitely look forward to having more. I do want to inform those of you that requested CEUs that you will receive a communication from us soon with instructions on credit processing. So that will be a separate follow-up email that you will be receiving. Again, thank you all so much for your time. Everyone have a great day. I will now end the webinar. Thank you.